You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. Another one of his friends who said he was sitting outside a pub with about three of his mates having a drink. And Ron pulled up, lovely sunny day, and went the wind down and said, do you fancy coming for a ride? And he went, no, not really, I'm having a drink with my friends. So he went, no, come, come and have a drink with me. Oh, come and have a ride, I've got to go somewhere. And he went, no, 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 I'm fine here. He went, OK, then. He said, oh, do us a favour, if I flip the boat, can you get my jacket out? He said, no, I should have realised then. Why would he want a jacket? It's a boiling hot day. He clicked the thing, lifted, there was, he shut it, he went, get in. He said there was a body in the boat. Many people do you think Ron killed? Ron said about 13. No and way. I think that was probably about right. That's a mass murderer. And the judge went, I don't believe a word anybody said about her. <laughs> he said, she... As be, I'm there trying to make me believe she was the smallest cog in the machine. She was the machine. And the, all of those, the men were, she was, she was the governor. He said, I'm not fooled at all. So he was getting home leaves? Yeah. Mm-hmm. But this day I, um, I used to take him home every week and we'd be indoors and then take him back. And that was when he got murdered on one of those days. And it was nothing at all to do with me at all. And I certainly wouldn't have had somebody murdered in my house. Boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got Linda Calvi. How are you, Linda? I'm fine. Thank you very much. Thanks Thank for coming you. on the show, Linda. Thank you for asking me. Very fascinating story. The Black Widow. <laughs> um, you've done seven years for armed robbery. I do. 18 years for murder. Every one of your boyfriends, husbands, have either been lifed off in prison or murdered. It's... Um, I'm a man who's never been engaged, and I can certainly say I won't be taking a nil today. It's um, what a story! I read your book, The Black Widow. I don't, I, I quite, I've got a short attention span, but I, I had to read that because obviously, it's very deep, very dark. Yes, you've got a very fascinating, yeah. fascinating story. We've met all the criminals of the underworld yeah. of London, but you were the lady boss of London. You were the the lady gangster, basically. Yeah. How's life? <laughs> Now life is wonderful. Easy, no dramas. No dramas. I now enjoy writing my books. I know a lot of people who know you as well. I've been trying to get you on the show for a while. We'll plug your books straight away, which yeah. is a locksmith. This is a new book that's this out. This is the new book. No. Um, it comes out tomorrow on the eighteenth. Or should I not say? Yeah, no, tomorrow? it's, it's yeah. out anyway. So right. time this goes out, it'll be out. So right. we'll yes, leave the link comes, in the description. Yeah, it comes out on the eighteenth. Um. It starts off as an honest family and through adversity, things go bad for them and the daughter decides that to keep them afloat, she decides to step her foot into the murky underworld. Um, It's going to be one little job and this one job, obviously, it's never one job because one job becomes two jobs and three jobs. And by the end of the book, they're major players in the underworld. So about like your true story, basically, a bit well, of your life as well. <laughs> it's not quite as exciting mm-hmm. as Ruby's, but I suppose <laughs> there's there's a bit of me in yeah. Ruby, yeah. I always go back to the start with my guests, where you grew up and how it all began. I grew up in the East End. I actually grew up in Stepney. I was one of nine children. I've got three brothers and five sisters. Um, I had a very normal, everyday upbringing. My parents both worked. My mum was a market trader. My dad was a blacksmith. Um, And the last thing I ever thought I would be was dealing in the underworld. So you had a good... (laughs) Because we spoke earlier, and a lot of people who came on this show have kind of had 
abusive upbringings a and a lot of trauma. Yeah. And they kind of go down to the violent route. But you had a, a strong, I steady did. upbringing. I had a very loving, kind um, upbringing. My parents were lovely. We didn't have a lot. But whatever we had, my mum and dad always made sure that we, we had enough. And as I say, we grew up very honest lives. And as in my new book, we all sort of knew the people next door or around the corner that was selling the knocked off stuff and whatever. Um, unlike Ruby's parents who wouldn't buy anything, I must admit my mum would buy the occasional mm -hmm. thing if it came up. But I actually never got involved in crime until I actually met my first husband. Is that Mickey? That's Mickey. Mm -hmm. And he was a bank robber? He was a bank robber. We'll touch on it. You were 11 years old, though. This red roller, the Rolls Royce, yes. is very important because you were 11 years old. I was, but that will be connected to what we're going to speak yes, about at the end. Yeah, I was 11 years old and it was that my mum and dad in his old van, his old works van. And we'd been to visit one of my aunts. And on the way coming back, we stopped at the lights and this beautiful big red car pulled up. And there was a man sitting with a big cigar in his mouth. And this lady sitting with a fur coat. And when I think back now, it must have stunk of smoke and been far inside that car. But to me, this was really magical. And I looked and went, oh, look at that beautiful big red car. One day I'm going to have a red car like that. And I'm going to have a fur coat. And my dad said, I hope you do, darling. He went, because if you do, that's a roller. A Rolls Royce, the best car in the world, he said, and that means you've arrived. And that was my inspiration that I wanted to end up with a Rolls Royce one day. No matter how you got it. <laughs> <laughs> and the funny thing was, all through my life, when I was doing what I was doing, I bought Mercedes, I had a Porsche, I had all different cars. I never had a Rolls Royce. And I got a Rolls Royce at the end of my sentence with my last husband, who actually was the only honest man <laughs> I'd ever gone out with. And he had a red Rolls Royce. It's mad that the older years are doing <laughs> madness to try and get the money to really get a Rolls was. Royce. You end up getting one that was legit. Because I didn't even know that he had this car. Um, it was towards the end of my sentence. And you used to be able to go out on a Sunday. You had to be collected at the time to be taken out and a couple of my friends girlfriends came and took me out for it we booked a meal and we got in the restaurant and it was a bit early and they said oh we're busy do you mind waiting and he was sitting with a friend and he there was an empty seat next to him and my friend said oh you sit down if you want do you want to see and I sat next to him and started chatting and he said, oh, you're out with your friends. I said, Jay said, yeah, I'm out with a friend of mine. Um, you know, you sort of just chat to strangers and all of a sudden he's telling me that he's been divorced twice. And I said, oh, well, I've been widowed once and, di <laughs> and divorced <laughs> once. No telling the truth. <laughs> <laughs> so I told him this. So then he went, are you with anybody? I said, no. He went, can I take you out for a meal? So I said, yes, you certainly can, but not till next Sunday. Mm -hmm. So he said, well, I'd like to take you out maybe Thursday, Friday. I said, no, I can only go out on a Sunday. So he said, why is that? So I said, because I'm in prison. So he laughed and he went, how can you be in prison? <laughs> you're visiting, like you're, you're in a restaurant. So I said, no, I'm in an open prison and explained that I could go out. And he said, OK, that's fine. At that time, he never asked me even what I was in prison for. I think he thought, well, if it's an open prison, it must be something quite minor. And he said to me, I'll pick you up next Sunday. Give me the address. So I was in the prison, and it's like a stately home, East Sutton Park. And all the staff sit and have their tea break in the hall. And when everybody goes out, they see who comes to collect them. And... I was still waiting. I was the last person. And I thought, oh, he's not going to turn up. I've made myself look stupid because I said to everybody, oh, I'm going out. This, this man's going to come and take me out. So I said to the, one of the girls cleaning, will you um, give me a call if somebody pulls up? So she went, yeah, of course I will. And about five minutes later, she shouted up the stairs, 
Lena, has he got a red roller? Mm. <laughs> and I thought, a red roller? It was just like so surreal. Mm. And I came down and there was this red Rolls Royce outside and he was standing outside going, waving like this. And I said, yeah, that's him. And one of the staff went, we've took the number. If that's a crook, you know, you're back inside. I said, he's not a crook, he's a businessman. Is that what I said to you? Yeah. Association. Yeah. Try to get you put because back I inside. think they just looked and thought Rolls Royce, that's got yeah, to be a two crook. Two and two together, isn't it? The majority of people have got rollers are dodgy, yeah. as sad as it is. <laughs> so that was it. They mm-hmm. checked him out and said, no, he's bona fide. And I got engaged while I, while I was in prison. And when I come home, we had a big wedding. But he said, I told him the story when we were out this first day for a meal. And he said to me, I can't imagine you've ever done anything. You look so lovely and sweet. I said, well, actually, (laughs) I might as well tell you the (laughs) truth. And I said to him, I've been in prison for armed robbery. And he was going, I know this is a wind up. And I went, no, it isn't. And then I said, I've been in prison for murder. I said, but I didn't do it. So he went, no, well, I believe that because I can't imagine you'd ever do anything like that. And I said, no, I didn't. I said, but I haven't told him how long I'd been in prison. And it never scared him off, bless him. And we ended up, when I got home, having this big wedding. And he unfortunately died five years ago. How many husbands, how many times have you been engaged? Um, I've been engaged... Four times and married three times. And every one dead? Every single man? No, I don't think Danny's dead. He was my co-defendant last time. So you went through a, lot, a bit of pain as well and a bit of trauma? Mm-hmm. See, so when your teenage years, like 14, 15, 16 before you met Mickey? Well, I never met Mickey till I was 19. Oh, so you were still... What was your life like then, before the run-up? Before, it was so ordinary. Um, I left school, I got a job in a office as a receptionist and I used to go out with my friends on a Friday night and go to the pictures on a Sunday night and it was it was just a normal a normal mm-hmm. life that everybody lived. So see when Mickey came involved in your life, was that a turn on? Did you know who I didn't he was? know no what happened? Um I saw one of my cousins down the market and she had her husband with her. And he said to me, oh, I suppose you're still with that dickhead. So I said, no, I'm not. (laughs) And I'd finished with this guy that I was with. He went, oh, you're on your own. I said, yeah, he went, perfect. You're coming to a party Saturday. So I said, all right, what's that for? So he said, oh, friend of mine, he's just come out of the big house. And at the time, I didn't even know what the big house was. And I went, what's the big house? He went, prison. I went, all right. So he said, he's just done eight years for armed robbery. He said, and we're having a party for him, but we've all met people, like, we mean we've got married, whatever, and he's on his own. So will you come so he don't feel out of place? And I went, "Mm, all right then. And I decided to go, and then I decided on the night, I got all ready, but changed my mind. And my cousin phoned and said, Lynn, please come because George is getting embarrassed. He said, you were coming. And she said, there's a cab on its way for you. So I had no choice, I did go. And for some reason, I just imagined that everybody in prison must be really ugly. It was, I mean, such a... (laughs) You're not far off, to be fair. No, I mean, actually, I'm not. (laughs) But for some weird reason, I just presumed, because all the films you used to see... All the baddies was ugly and all the, <laughs> and all the so-called goodies was like all the good-looking ones. And I thought, no, I don't fancy that, some ugly mate. And he got told that I was going to turn up. And he said to me, I didn't want you to turn up. I thought, what sort of girl hasn't got a bloke at 19 years of age? She must be a right old dog. <laughs> so <laughs> neither of us really wanted to go. And when I walked in... And I see him talking to George, and I thought, oh, he's nice. And he looked across, and George went, come over. And walked over, and he went, Linda, Mickey, Mickey, Linda. And the rest was history. <laughs> when did you start finding out that it was... You knew he was an armed robber anyway, for being out of prison. Was... The man before that, 
Your, your boyfriend, you, that, you didn't know he was married? No, I didn't. I went out with him. I know that is how naive I was. I went out with him for a couple of years. And I used to say, why don't we go around your house? Oh, no, because my dad, my dad don't like people coming in the house and my mum's not well and all these excuses. And my mum went, it's not right. Hmm. <laughs> oh, sorry. That's okay. So you oh knew. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's okay. Just, that you keep can that cut in anyway. that. No, oh, just, can... just leave it. There's no <laughs> one. Right? We just go with the flow. Is um. So he, you were seeing him. That he was married, and you didn't know. No. Mm-hmm. And then by the time I did find out, well, the way I found out was that my mum had a little boutique at the time, and she used to let people come in and pay off the clothes, and this girl come in with a baby and picked a dress out and she said oh can I leave a pound or whatever it was like five quid or something the dress and my mum went yeah of course you can and then another woman came in and started talking to her and she'd already said oh, her surname and then she was chatting and she said oh is your Terry still on the coal and still t-? she went yeah he's on the coal but he'll be going back to the scrap next week and my mum thought I know who that is. So she's come home. My dad's come home from work. And she went, right, I've been waiting for your father. Get your coat on, we're going out. So my dad went, where are we going? Because my mum was the boss. So she said, right, this address, where is it? And my dad said, oh, I know where that is. And she went and knocked on the door with me standing next to her and went, your husband's going out with my daughter. And I thought, oh, no, I don't believe this. And my dad, I think, wanted to be swallowed up. And that was my first boyfriend. First heartbreak. You heartbroken? <laughs> I was, actually. What did your dad, what did your mum and dad take of uh, Mickey? Um, my dad liked him, but he was, wasn't really happy that he was a crook. My mum said she liked him, but for the same thing, she went, look, it's really, she went, he's just done eight years. He's just come home. She went, what future have you got? What is he going to do? What's he going to do for a living? I said, I don't know. He'd probably get a job. And I said to him, my mum and dad said, what job are you going to do? He said, the job I've always done, I'm an arm robber. And I thought, well, I can't really say that to my mum mm-hmm. and dad. And I went, he's looking. He don't know what he wants yet. But that was actually... <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy, though, that a clean-cut girl, because the photos of you when you are younger, you were a beautiful girl, beautiful young girl. You can see why all the bad men always... It's like a trophy as well, having a good-looking girl. And was that... So when you were only 19 and 20, do you think you could have been manipulated into that life as well? To I think I was, because I was, I was actually really quite sheltered. I mean, as, I, as my younger sisters got older, they was allowed to sort of go out and do a lot more than me. I was the eldest girl. So it was, no, you've got to be in at 11 and you've got to do this. And it was... You wrapped, wrapped in cotton wool yeah, a bit more. Yeah, more so, I think. And especially with my elder brother. If any boys used to walk me home and they'd stand on the doorstep and kiss me, the letterbox would come up and he'd go, do yourselves a favour. <laughs> Fuck off. Yeah. And I was going, Mum, I'll never get a boyfriend mm-hmm. with him. How old was Mickey? Mickey was 28. Well, 27 still, still when I met him. Still young then as well. Yeah. How many banks did he... Do? So when he was coming in with money, I had the getting ready, balaclavas ready, getting the guns mm. ready... Were you there at that time? Were you, was that an not excitement in the very for you? Be- not in the very beginning. Um, obviously, because I was his girlfriend, so I wasn't in that... Circle. Cir- circle. But then when um, we moved in together and I had my daughter, and Mickey never le- couldn't drive because he'd gone away so young, he never learned to drive. So he always used to say, I'll be the anchor man, which is the first one that goes in and the last one that comes out, which is the one, the worst job to yeah, have so when you're doing that. Balls in. And he went, I don't drive, so I'll step up and I'll always do that. So he was, he was really sort of popular to, to do, mm-hmm. like, you know, to sort of do the job. Could jobs. not get used then a lot more because people knew he was first in and last out? Yeah, 
I think he, he had such a good name and everybody used to say, oh, you can stand on Mickey. Yeah, Mickey, can... Mickey goes in first, Mickey comes out last to compensate for the fact he didn't drive. Did you think he had something to prove as well, constantly doing that? No, I don't know if he did or not. I don't know. But um, that was he was quite proud of the fact that everybody knew that that was his job. Yeah, he he was would go 100%. in. 100%. Yeah, so you could go in and you don't know what's going to be in there when you first go in. And you're still the last one to come out. So it, it is the worst position to take. Yeah. But he always did do that. But it's the one that gets the most respect. Mm. Mm-hmm. So when you started, when was the first time you'd seen him going to a job? Were you well, nervous? Were you scared? Yeah, I was actually. And um, the very first time was when we were living together and my daughter was only young, a few months. And he said, um, look, I'm going to have the guys around here because where he didn't drive, they all drove. And they, they would come round and sit round the table. And it in the end, become quite surreal that they'd be sitting there with big maps out and going, right, we're looking at this one, or well, there's a possibility of this one. If we have this one, we need three people. If we have this one... And it was like a military operation. <laughs> <laughs> and it'd be, yeah, well, what's the outs on that one? And I'd be going, anyone want another cup of tea? Mm. Anyone want a sandwich? And then being nosy, <laughs> I'd sort of be going... And sort of looking mm. ill. And... I sort of started going, because I drove, he didn't. So he used to say to me, once we got to that point, Linda would drive me round so I can see what I think for outs and whatever. And they sort of see like a building site and they go, there's a hole in there. Yeah, that, that's a thing we can do. They always planned it as if they were going to get caught. And that is the best way to do it. Why is that? Well, because if you go thinking, yeah, I'm going to do it and I'm getting away with it. And you go, right, and when we come out, we drive down here. Well, you might not be able to drive down there because there might be a, anything. There Old could block. be there could be a, a, an accident. There could be anything. So you've got to think, well, I can't go down there. So where do I go? Right, so we can go down this way. But if we go this way, how do we get from here? So they always said you planned three, four routes, thinking, well, if that one you can't do, you can do that one or you can mm. do this one. And I think that's why they were so yeah. successful, so because they yeah. always planned so many routes. So it wasn't just a kamikaze job, like a lot no. of people nowadays just get in Just out run in and, and out. out. Yeah, they away. really did it. To perfection, and, basically. Yeah, mm-hmm. and it's sort of, you'd go down turnings where there'd be sort of... Um, you know, like the bollards in the road, so you can't go drive mm. through, but they go, right, well, we'll have a couple of motorbikes outside. May not even be used, but they were there in case you had to run through and there's a police car behind you, but if you've got motorbikes, you can carry mm. on, they're stuck. Yeah. So it, I learnt from them, listening to them, exactly how you did everything. Mm. And I used to actually go out with him, so to, to do the sort of wreck is the surveillance kind of mm. stuff how was that um was that ev- how long was it to plan a job a couple Actually, of weeks couple of months days sometimes would be a couple of months sometimes might only be a couple of weeks the actual job itself would be like minutes yeah but the planning of that job mm-hmm. was as i say like a military operation was there ever a number in his head for you if he's got the love of his life if you've got the kid he's the love of your life to say look Let's get a certain amount of money and let's do the tours, yeah. maybe go abroad or whatever. Yeah. But the greed always wins. Was there ever a, a target in your mind or his mind to get out? Um, well, he said he wanted a nice house. And it was the beginnings of the times when people were saying about Spain. Up until then, it was you, you wanted to caravan down <laughs> wherever. Yeah. But then it was people started going, oh, no, go to Spain. And... It was sort of the ambition, I think, of most villains all get a place in Spain. So his thing was, we get a house and we get a place in Spain. So he, he sort of had a goal, but whether he'd actually get to that goal and it, and it would have stopped That's is a enough. That's story. Yeah. yeah. How many jobs do you think you've done while you're with you? Oh, quite a lot. Yeah? Yeah. Did you ever go to any jobs? Not just surveillance, but not, driver? Not with, not with him. I didn't do anything until he died. Mm-hmm. And how was that then? Because I, I know 
when he was putting, sh- when he used to take the shotgun shells out, he used to take the gunpowder out and put cotton wool yeah. in it. Is that yeah. correct? Yes. Yeah. Mm. On the actual day that he died, the night before he got his gun out and it was sawn off shotgun and he was sitting and he tipped all the pellets out and then he put wadding in and then he sealed the top back up with candle wax and sealed them. And that, that was the first time I'd ever seen him do it. And I said to him, why are you doing that? And he said, because it's December, it's a supermarket. There's going to be women and children about. If I've got to pull the trigger, I know I can't hurt nobody. All I'm going to do is make a noise. He said, so there's no way. He said, but if, if I think I'm going to be confronted by security or police or whatever, he said, I'll just go boom. And they can think, right, he said, it gives you that little bit of, of an edge. But he, w- he said, I will not have anything in, in the cartridges. So that is why the next day when he was shot dead, and they, they tried to tell me their version was that he faced them like it was the Wild West and when it shoot me or you, it was like, are you for real? And I said, you shot him through the back. And they went, no, 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 we've already, everything's done. I said, no, you shot him through the back. No intelligent person would stand with an empty gun and look at somebody with a loaded gun and go, it's me or you. And I thought, they're talking like it's a film. And that was the start of my battles with the police. So you become an authority then? Well, then I really sort of went into it because obviously all his friends were coming round and going, right, Lynn, what's the SP? And I said, he was shot through the back. And they said, are you sure? And I said, yes, because he sat and took all the cartridges out, uh, all the little things out the cartridges. So then we started investigating. And in those days, everybody knew a copper. So you always got news of what was going on and what was happening. And we eventually found out that, yes, he was shot through the back. Um, The policeman who did it was on his own. We were told that he was off duty and he'd still got the gun out, so he'd got the gun out illegally. It should have been back in the station. We were told what we were needed to ask for, the duty roster, the gun um, book. Well, suddenly there was uh, accidentally somebody had knocked a cup of tea over one, so it was illegible, and the other one had gone astray. But everybody knew what really happened. And they said, oh, we've already done the autopsy. He was shot through the front and the bullet came out of his back. And I said, I want my own autopsy. So we went to a solicitor and the solicitor said, right, I'll get a, um, one of those people that does the autopsies. He said, we go for the best one in the land and then whatever the answer is, it can't be disputed. And they did the autopsy. Oh, first of all, we got told, yes, we've got, we've got this guy to go and do it. When he went to the mortuary, they said, oh, the body's lost. What? Yeah. So they, he said, you can't lose a body. What are you talking about? So contacted the solicitor and said, I don't know what's going on here, but they've said they've lost the body. And we had to go to court to get Mickey's body back. I mean, how, these... It how long later? Um, it was a few days later, mm-hmm. because the magistrate said... You cannot lose a body. This body must be returned for the coroner to do what he, what he has to do. Um, and you've got 48 hours to return the body. So then the body did turn up. And our autopsy stated he was shot through the back and the, and the bullet come out the front. See then, but was it the coppers not as the flying squad? Was it the Sweeney? Like the Sweeney it kind was of like the not Sweeney. come on site? In those days, they were like mm-hmm. the Sweeney. Yeah. They really were. So who was on the job with him? Was there no one there to say it? Was no. that because he was always last out? Yes. Mm-hmm. This, there was three, and two had got in the car, and 
the, yeah, the people, there was quite a lot of witnesses and they said he was locked out of the car and the car drove off and he jumped on the back of the car. And when he was spread eagle, eagled on the back of the car, that's when he was shot. So somebody locked him out, the people he was working with? Mm. Is this Ron? This came out after... I never knew that mm. it ended up it was and Ron that, who locked him out. And this is a man who was obsessed with you? Mm. So after Mickey got killed, how was your life then? What was the plan? Was it just a case of, I want to get into crime myself? I want to just... No, I think at the time... Um, well, I, I was just demented, I think, because I remember as I got told by Mickey's brother, um, Mickey's dad, all I could hear was somebody screaming and screaming and screaming. And I heard somebody going, slap her around the face, she's hysterical. And I, could, I was going, yeah, slap her around the face, she's hysterical. But it was obviously in my head I was saying it. And it, it was me that was screaming. And I think, and I still say now, something changed in my brain that day. And it never changed back until I got arrested all those years later. Did you just kind of have a little fuck it button then? Just... Yeah, I think I did. Yeah. So what kind of, who were you involved with after Mickey? Who did, what, um, well, it, did you have any other girls around you, or other women, or was it just you and just me, the gangsters? The, yeah. It's funny that how you can be conditioned to end up thinking like them. I always say, but show yeah. me your friends, and I'll show you your future. Yeah. You just become part of that, yeah. no matter what your upbringing was. And they all respected me so much, and they would really say, "Well, what does Linda think?" In the end, I sort of had the final say on everything. The brains. Yeah. So weird. <laughs> <laughs> Did anybody ever say to you that, listen, you're going down the wrong way or was people too scared of you? No, I mean, some people used to say to me, Lynn, are you doing the right thing? And I went, yes. <laughs> that mm -hmm. was it. Yes, I am. What was your mum and dad saying at that time after Mickey? Oh, they was, I mean, my mum and dad were really, really upset when Mickey died. And Ron suddenly came into my life. And he, I was really rock bottom from Mickey. And all of a sudden, Ron was there. And he really played a game to get me. Really did. And even at, um, there was, like, a lot of the people, they'd done benefits. They did a couple of benefits for me. And at the first one, I was standing at the door and we were saying, oh, thank you for coming, thank you for coming. And Ron came in and he, there was a big bottle of Chanel perfume and he went, this is for you. And I went, oh, thank you. And he went, are you okay? So I said, just thank you. And he went in and I mean, going back now, Mickey's been dead over 40 years. So at the, um, when we went into the, went into the hole and they said, right, we're gonna do some auctions and there was a case of wine and he said right it was starting the bid off and people so I think it was like 30 quid 40 quid and he went thousand pound so they went thousand pound don't suppose anybody's going to top that I mean ten a thousand pound 42 years ago was a yeah, lot of money 20, 30 grand now so they went right sold to Ronnie Cook so he walked over put the ground down and he went I'll raffle it again and just went. And a couple of people went to me, be careful, Lynn, he's such a dangerous man. And I went, well, what's he doing? He hasn't done anything. But I think other people could see what he was doing and I couldn't see it. Because you were vulnerable? Mm. Mm -hmm. So always people <laughs> say, told you so, is always a bastard, isn't it? When they say, I, I told you so. But you would have probably just needed that other figure there kind of controlling power freak just the money as well I don't know how you were with people with money as well that money can buy you anything I believe and it's scary mm. that how much we love people love money and how people can mm. be manipulated by it so was he a big strong man very dangerous he was he was he wasn't big he was very strong I think he was only about five foot eight five foot nine but he was really strong but his strength was Mental. That he was that he was a nutcase, yeah. and 
even all the big tough mates that was Mickey had at the time and all that went, you don't take Ron Cook on because you can't win him. If you have a fight with him and you win, you've lost because he will come back and kill you. And he was in your life with Mickey before Mickey got killed? Just only a couple of months prior. Mm -hmm. And Mickey had said to me, oh, I've got a new guy that I'm working with. So I said, all right. And the only time I'd ever seen him, um, we were going out on a Saturday night. And I'd got all ready, got dressed, just had this sort of pale blue silky dressing gown tied up around my waist. And there was a knock at the door. Mickey was in the shower. And I opened the door and he was jogging on the spot in a tracksuit. And he said, oh, is Mickey there? So I said, uh, he's in the shower, I'll call him. So I went, Mick, there's somebody here for you, is it? He said, I'll tell him it's Ron. So I said, it's Ron. So he went, I'll tell him, don't worry, I'll come back tomorrow. And Ron said to me from that day, he looked at me and fell in love with me. He said, and it's all your fault, everything that happened after that. So this is before even Mickey was killed or anything? Do you and think that's, potentially Ron killed Mickey? Well, I think, yes, he locked him out of the car. Do you think he could have shot him? He could have shot him. And I think he was thinking that how to get rid of him. And he got that, took that opportunity. I don't think maybe to think he would have got shot. But to get caught, he would have got 15 years. So I think he was thinking, right, I'm, I can get rid of you yeah, now. take him off the cars and then he can slip in to yeah, make his way with you. he actually died, so... Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how did the relationship end up starting with Ron? Um, as I say, he came to this benefit. So he bought you, basically? And then he came to the next one, and he did the exact same £1,000, mm -hmm. pound, done that. Um, and he came around, and he was, look, it's a few grand, anything you need for the kids, anything I can do for you, blah, blah, blah. Um, and he was so polite and sort of, really gentlemanly. He was the complete opposite of what everybody told me he was. And um, he first of all said to me, can I take you out for a meal? I said, oh, I won't go out because it's Mickey's not been dead very long. And he said, oh, no, no, just as a friend. He said, ask one of your brothers or one of your sisters or something to come. And my, my younger brother said, yeah, I'll come. And he came out and we went out sort of every week for about six, seven weeks. And then in the end, he said to my brother, do yourself a favour, I don't want you coming out of us no more. And my brother went, oh, he went, Lynn, what are you doing? But by then it was too late. Did you fall in love with him? Not really, no. Do you think that was just for security for yourself as well? Maybe? I don't know. It was... As I say, I was thought, my thoughts in those days were very, very different. Yeah. Really different. Did he not used to drive in the car with dead bodies in the boot? Yes. What were you thinking then, though? Was that not... Yeah, but a, I didn't that, know. I mean, he actually came to my house. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I'm he, laughing because it's... <laughs> is that not an out? Is that not your, your, your car to say, right, wait a minute, I need to go here? Yes. Or were you scared you, of him? But you couldn't go. Would you, would you have got killed? You couldn't go. Would I you couldn't. have got killed? Well, he said to me, y you're mine. You you can't go anywhere. Was that a turn on for you, though, that somebody had that no, power over really, you? No, not really, because I thought, I don't like this, because I've never had this before. Mm -hmm. I've never... Mickey was the most easygoing person in the world, and I could say, oh, my sisters have phoned up. Can I go? Yeah, fine. Do what you want to do. And I'd go to my sisters or friends had phoned me up and do you fancy doing it? yeah he'd go fine you, you're going to enjoy yourself and he had dead and bodies in was, the book and Mickey never had oh, Ron. Ron did I mean the first he never ever ever brought anybody into my home and one Saturday he said to me I'm bringing a friend for a meal and I want you to get exactly what I asked you to get and I went, God, he must be really special. You've never, ever invited anybody. And he said, uh, no, he is really special. And it was a, such a simple meal. He wanted a prawn cocktail. He wanted steak with all the trimmings. He wanted his cheesecake. He, and he wanted 
with the white wine, etc. And I said, yeah, that's fine. I'll get all that. He said, but it's just for me and him, not for you. So I said, that's fine. So I said, okay. So done his meal, served it all up. And I, I went, sat, chatted in with one of my neighbours for an hour. And then I came back and he said, right, um, I've put on the bed what I want you to wear. I'll be back about eight. So I said, yeah, okay. And this other guy said to me, oh, it's really lovely to meet you. So he said, oh, we'll be out tonight then, Mon. He went, well, we are, me and her, I don't know about you. And I can remember him saying that. And this guy, the thing I can remember, the, he had really beautiful teeth, this guy. Lovely, lovely teeth. And Ron came back, picked me up. We went to the needle gun, we went in, ordered a drink, and he said to me, I'm going to be about 30 minutes, don't talk to nobody, and tell me who comes in and who goes. And when he came back, he said to me, oh, who have you spoken to? I said, I haven't spoken to anybody, it's re not really anybody coming in. And uh, afterwards he said to me, I said, oh, you didn't bring your friend? He said, yeah, I did, he was in the boat. <laughs> <laughs> so the person he was talking about was in the boot dead? Was in the boot. He said, he's not there now, I've got rid of him. I've put him over acne marshes. And then the next day he said to me, go and get all the newspapers. Well, Ron never read the newspapers. Could he read? So he, he could, but not very well. And he said to me, go and get the news." And he went all through them, threw them all on the floor. He went, that's weird. So I said, what? He said, it's not in the papers. I went, well, it won't be in the papers if it happened last night. Mm. It'd be in tomorrow's papers if they find him. And the next day it was in the papers. He went, oh, good, I'm glad they found him. What were you thinking then? Did you already, you already knew he was a psychopath? Well, that was it, exactly. Yeah. Could you not leave then? Were you too no. frightened to? I mean, there was a, one of his friends, another one of his friends who said he was sitting outside a pub with about three of his mates having a drink. And Ron pulled up, lovely sunny day, and went the window down and said, do you fancy coming for a ride? And he went, no, not really, I'm having a drink with my friends. So he went, no, come, come and have a drink with me. Oh, come and have a ride, I've got to go somewhere. And he went, no, 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 I'm fine here. He went, okay then. He said, oh, do us a favour, if I flip the boat, can you get my jacket out? He said, no, I should have realised then. Why would he want a jacket? It's a boiling hot day. He clicked the thing, lift it, there was, he shut it, he went, get in. He said there was a body in the boat. How many people do you think Ron killed? Ron said about 13. No and way. I think that was probably about right. That's a mass murderer. Fucking hell, Linda. No wonder you done a, a long <laughs> sentence in the jail to get away from the <laughs> crackpot, man. It's, um, that's nuts. Yeah. That, to see that. But it's like people that knew him all said, Lynn, he tops people. Well, you can't row with him. Was he a hitman? Or just do it through I think vengeance? he would just do it, yeah. The buzz of it? Yeah, I think so. I mean, another time I was um, in a pub with him and my sister-in-law and a guy come in, They've quite a few of them come in. There was somebody out on a home leave, really drunk, and he looked over, he went, oh, Ron. And he'd come over, he went, hello, Ron, how are you? Blah, blah, blah. And Ron was going, yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine. And I thought, oh, he's really drunk, this guy. And he all of a sudden, he stood on my foot. And Ron went, you stood on her foot. So he turned around, he went, well, it's only an old slag, isn't it? Well, that was it, you could hear a pin drop. And Ron went, what did you say? Do you know who that is? You've just insulted. He said, that's Linda Calvey. So he was going, like, as if you ever knew Linda Calvey, right? So he said, Mickey Calvey's widow, and you've just insulted her and you've called her that. And he went, oh, sorry, mate. So he went, get on the floor and kiss her feet and ask her to say so, uh, ask her to let you off. So he ended up getting on the floor, kissing my feet. I felt so embarrassed. And there's all these other big, like, like this, all standing over, going, like, as if, oh, what is going on here? And he's kissed my feet and went, I'm sorry, I'm drunk, and I 
I didn't know. And Ron's standing behind him going... So I went, no, sorry, I can't say, I can't accept it. So he's gone, please. And that, Ron's going to me like this. So I've gone, I can't say sorry. And Maureen, with that, thank God, come over and went, Ron, stop it. She went, get up, mate. Go over with your friends. And that was it. Do you think he could have killed him potentially? I think he possibly might have that done was a green, afterwards. That was a green light for you to say, I'm not accepting your apologies for him to say, right, I'm going to kill you. So I don't know. Mm-hmm. But I don't know, never see this this person ever again. <laughs> so. That's not a good thing, though. That's no, not a good thing. but I mean, it was. it's like the sort of things you see in films and you go, like, yeah. no, that's not, that can't but happen. hearing that, if he's killed 13 people, that's worse than a film. That's worse than a horror film. Yeah. More people are dead. That is why none of them would come over and and say anything. Yeah, fuck. <laughs> Anybody <laughs> with a right frame of mind would know about five miles away from your gaff. How, were you scared to leave him in case he killed your dad? No, but um, he had said to other people, if she leaves me, I'll kill her son. Yeah. He said, I don't like her son. He looks like his dad. He must have really been jealous then, eh, yeah. Mickey, because he was well liked. And and he said that um, Neil looked like his, his dad. Did he that, hated him. Did that ever give you the fear every night that he could have potentially killed him because the jealousy and the envy that he had for your ex-husband? Yeah, I think possibly he could have. Mm-hmm. And you had to mm. stick by it. When was the first time you'd done a robbery? After he went away... Ron? Yeah. Ron, Ron got caught on a robbery. He got 16 years. How was that a relief for you? Well, I thought, oh, that's a relief. <laughs> mm-hmm. That he got caught. But he said to me, um, he said, you will wait, won't you? He said, because you've got a lovely son. And I went, yeah, of course I will. What a bastard. <laughs> that? The manipulation. I know. Mm. And what would you have waited? But the funny thing was, the, the one person who wasn't frightened of him was Brian Thorogood, who had been his friend forever. And he was the only one who could say to him, shut up, you dozy bee. And he'd go, and he would accept it off of him. Why is that? I don't know. They just had that thing. And when I first met him, I never liked Brian, and Brian never liked me. And so when Ron went away, Ron said, right, he can't stand you. You can't stand him. So I'm going to get him to look after you while I'm away. But Brian ended up falling in love with me. (laughs) (laughs) Did you fall in love with him? I did, actually. (laughs) (laughs) So that stupid bastard's put him on thinking that you hate each other. Was he putting... We did. Yeah. At that time, because he went, I'll do us a favour. You want me to look after her? And he went, yeah, I do. So he's put you on to you thinking... Was he... When he's been in watching over you... He was an armed robber and that's when I started doing the armed robberies. And what was it like doing your first job? Were you driving or were you in the bank? I was driving. What was that feeling for you? It was like, it was the strangest. It was sort of as if you was floating. It was really I can't explain it. It's like your feet wasn't on the floor. Do you know? Do you know what I mean? It was adrenaline. Sort of, yeah, I think it was so. Yeah. Was that and you that hooked? Was, that was it. How much did you get your first job? I think we got about 15,000. How many involved? Three. Did you pick up the information that you'd learned from Mickey beforehand with? Yes. Like escape routes, different plan A, plan B, plan C? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And people were just, were you calling the shots? Were you telling people? In the end, I was, yeah, because Brian went, look, I'm brown, she's brains. Mm -hmm. So it's like a (laughs) Bonnie and Clyde kind of thing? Yeah. Fucking hell, Linda. <laughs> and I know, and I look back and think, everybody goes to me, we can't imagine you doing anything. Mm-hmm. But do you think that's why you got away with so much? Probably. Because it's like butter wouldn't melt. <laughs> you filled everybody. You I fucking used, filled I mean, everybody. We used to, I used to get out of the car, have a shopping trolley, put the money in there, 
and then just wheel back and walk. And I'd walk deliberately past where it happened and go, oh, what's happened? And they go, oh, they've just been robbed. And I go, oh, my God. <laughs> There's me with the money in the mm-hmm. shopping trolley. How was it then? How many, many jobs do you think you'd done back then? Oh, loads. Yeah? Yeah. Did you ever do a few in the same day, same week? A couple of times. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, one, we did two in one day. It was only just the second one was there and you just you just had to go. <laughs> <laughs> so was Brian, obviously, if, it's a, if you love somebody as well, but obviously if you've got that mentality, but everything that I do now is for my family. I, I'm, I believe I'm going to create something special mm. with what I'm doing is to get my family a better life. So I don't want to put anybody in danger. I've got a daughter at 10. Mm. I know what men are like. That was one of the worst. So it's difficult. But I don't think I could be taking my missus along with doing a bank job yeah. or doing that. Did he ever say, look, you stay back today in case we get caught? I know, it just ended up. But, I mean, men used to come say, can I, look, can I be on something? And I'd sort of give them a job interview <laughs> to see whether they were suitable. And I didn't even say what I used to ask them. Tell me. <laughs> no, I can't. <laughs> I think so you can that, guess. That was an interview for... To do a bank job with you? Did you know yeah. about who was up for it and who was not? Because a lot of people yeah. can talk the talk, yeah, but and you, you know, know yourself, they talk yeah, a lot of shit. you can talk to people and then yeah. you can go, no. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so you sense that straight away. So you were ingrained to then know who mm. was real and who was fake. Yeah. So, but Ron, so this is, this is weird because when you, the reason you get caught is not because you are, you are making mistakes. No. Because wasn't. Ron was getting suspicious. He had a private detective no, on not, you. No, not Ron. Uh-huh. It was Brian's ex-wife. She got a private detective on him. Because he, he told her that he wanted the house to be sold. Mm-hmm. And she didn't want to sell it. So she thought, I'll get him checked out and if I can get anything on him. So this private detective followed him and saw us doing a job. So he reported it, and so that was it. So the coppers, we were then put under surveillance, but they I've got to grudgingly give it to them. They was very good. We didn't know they mm-hmm. was there. Mm-hmm. So the private detective that Brian's missus has put on to use is then, the ones that end up... He ended up reporting that, the private detective? Yeah. yeah. And even the police said, you were so good, we didn't ever call you on your own merits. You were too good. Do you think you'd have so ever... So I suppose that was quite a... As a compliment, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Was, uh, do you think you'd have ever stopped if you never got yeah. caught, though? No, I think... I'd like to think I would. Because I've had Noel Razor Smith on the podcast, who's an absolute diamond. I've got yeah. so much time for Noel. Alleged that he's done over 200 banks, mm. couldn't change, and every time he try to quit, suck back in. I'd say I'd like... I'd like to think I would. Mm-hmm. But I got caught, so... And that was that was it. I said, that's that's the finish. I will never ever do it again. And you got one of the biggest sentences ever. Was I had it over the biggest, seven years. Uh, at the time that I got seven years, I had the biggest sentence in Holloway. Because going back all those years ago, women never got big sentences. They'd get sort of six months a year, eighteen months. What did Brian get? He got twenty one years. Did they not take the blame though? Did they not came yeah, they a, did. admit to a lot because of charges? Because what happened, um, the three of us got arrested, Carl Gibney, Brian and myself. And they said to the police, okay, we're, we're banged to rights, but we can do, can we have a little deal here? We'll hold our hands up to other things and you drop her out. And... They said, well, we'll do what we can do. So they ended up, he said, she, I want her to have bail. So they said, OK, give us a couple of robberies, she can have bail. So they said, this one, this one, this one. And they sort of started negotiating and it was drop her down to the, they said, we can't, she can't disappear. She's got to be on the charge sheet, but we'll put her as the most minor person. And we speak for her. So that was the deal. So for that, Brian told him about 21 armed robberies. And he went, my throat's dried up, I can't tell you anymore. Mm. <laughs> and I thought, oh, bless him. And Cole told him he was on 15 of those. 
So they did. They really did their best to help me. Mm-hmm. What was Ron saying at this time then? When he oh, he, he wanted know? to kill. He said <laughs> he wanted to <laughs> kill Brian. <laughs> When did he find out? Were you getting letters? It's, not, it was, ba- it's not like now you've got mobile phones. You oh can, no, he, he didn't find out until he read the newspaper. <laughs> and it was Black Widow Gang. Uh-huh. Is that what you were called, the Black Widow yeah, Gang? Because yeah. the yeah. Black Widow name is for you when you lost Mickey. You yeah. wore black for six months. Yeah, which I thought was normal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what happened then when Brian got the jail, you got the jail? How was life in prison for you? Well, I accepted it. I committed the crimes, so I accepted it. It's not nice. Prison isn't nice. Nobody How old can... were you? Um, what was I, 30, 36? And how old were your kids then? They were, um, my daughter was 13, my son was nine. And who was that then? Well, my daughter went and, and lived with my mum mm-hmm. and my someone and live with my older brother that's the heartbreaking thing yeah. even though all the trauma and yeah. everything the ripple and that was effect it. And, and the I victims said, yeah. and I said that's it I will never ever ever do anything again to be kept away from my kids I will never ever do it again how did people treat you in prison were you feared well the funny thing is I mean because I'm just ordinary really and you get some really tough hard girls in prison but I was never bullied I think my title stood me in good stead. And I think the fact, oh, she's the big arm robber, that all the girls sort of in that world looked up to me and went, oh, wow, she's the big arm robber. So I was really treated well, but there's a lot of bullying in prison, a hell of a lot, of, you know. Even more so with in the female prisons? Yeah, I think so. Because there's no, is there any protection wings or anything? In no, the f- not, no, not in women's prisons. Mm-hmm. So you're mixing with everybody? Yeah. Long did you, you done the full seven? No, I did, um, I got two years knocked off on appeal. And I think that was only because everybody else appealed. Um, and they all got two years off, so I got two years off. What did you do with life Cause when the, you got out? I mean, the judge... When we got found guilty, the judge, I thought, God, how does he know? Because everybody said in the court, she was the most minor person. She she was made to do it by these big men and blah, blah, blah. And even the police said, um, no, she was made to do this. We have truly believed she was a victim, et cetera, et cetera. And the judge went, I don't believe a word anybody said about her. He said... She, has been, I'm there trying to make me believe she was the smallest cog in the machine. She was the machine. And the, all of those, the men were, she was, she was the governor. He said, I'm not fooled at all, but I can't sentence her on that. He said, because the evidence hasn't been put to me. He went, but she should be getting 21 years today. And I thought, what? So he said, I'm going to give you the biggest sentence I can and hope you don't get a day off on appeal. And I got seven years, but because everybody appealed, I appealed and I got two years off as well. So it went down to five. And then I did three years, six months out of that. Just a long time for your first sentence. Mm. What did you do with your life when you got out then? I started a business with my, one of my sisters, um, making curtains. Did you have dough tucked aside though, coming out to it? We had to, I had a little bit and uh, my sister Maxine, she said, well, do, you, do you fancy setting up something? We do it together. And I started doing a curtain, bespoke curtains. And I was living a, a straight, honest life. How was that for you? I actually was getting on quite well. I mean, I've, I'd promised my kids, that's it, never, ever again. And prison isn't nice. And I certainly didn't want to go back there. So I was quite happy with doing what I was doing. Were you worried that Ron was going to come out and kill you? No, I didn't think Ron would kill me. Um, I used to still visit him. 
and what was the first visit like? Oh, when I I got taken from Holloway Prison to go and see him. So you were getting visits from prison. I got, yeah, I got taken to Franklin Prison, and when he walked in, he had the newspapers under one arm and a box of chocolates under the other, <laughs> and he went put the newspapers down. He went. Fucking Brian Farragut, he said, I'm going to have him killed. No, I'm not going to have him killed. I'm going to kill him. He went, how could he embarrass me? How could, how could you let him do this to you? Did you oh, play the innocent girl, yeah, bro? of course. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. No. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, See, even now he's upsetting you. He <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> fell for that. And then at the end, I thought, it's all right, I've, I've won him round. Mm. And then as well, they said, right, visit's finished. I said, well, am I getting them chocolates or are they melting under your arm? And he went, yeah, you can have them. I wasn't going to give them to you if I didn't <laughs> believe you. <laughs> Gullible bastard. I don't know. It was, even though these nutcases and that, I've used some nutcases as well, and you can tell the vulnerability and how gullible they are as well. Yeah. That, that's why they're so psychotic as well, because they think they're doing nothing wrong. So, so uh, what, what happened then when you get out? Who was the relationship with then? Uh, then I wasn't. So you were single? Yeah. Lucky for men then. <laughs> Free men that time. How could you worried. say that? <laughs> so, what, who came into your life next? What man? Um, well, there was no man in my life then. Mm-hmm. There was there was Ron. So just Ron? Yeah. But and Ron was coming out, like I used to, mm-hmm. he was coming out for days out. So he was getting home leaves? Yeah. Mm-hmm. But this day I... Um, I used to take him home every week and we'd be indoors and then take him back. And that was when he got murdered on one of those days. And it was nothing at all to do with me at all. And I certainly wouldn't have had somebody murdered in my house. And it ended up it was Danny Reese, but I was not aware of this murder happening. And who's Danny again? Danny was a friend of Brian's. So, were you having an affair with Danny or anything? No, he was in prison. Mm-hmm. So, Ron got out, home leaves, Danny was in your house. But da- Danny- no, what happened? Danny had got to the end of his sentence and I used to visit him on, for Brian. I used to go and visit him. And he said to me, oh, I'm home next weekend. So I said, oh, lovely, I'll come and get you. And he went, no, I'm a big boy, I can get on a train, I don't need being t- picked up. So I said to him, well, what are you going to do? So he said, first stop's going to be the cemetery because his son had been killed in a car accident. And I said, well, that's it, I'll pick you up. I'm not going to let you get on a train and walk around the cemetery and try and find a grave on your own. I'll pick you up. And that was the only reason that I actually picked him up. And there was people in court that said, oh, we saw Danny Reese in the um, cemetery with a blonde lady and he was sobbing on his son's grave. That, it was the truth. That is the reason I picked him up. And because he was so upset, I took him to my house. To, I said, go to my house and freshen up before I drop you off at your mum's. And he was there and my son come in and he'd got a bootleg copy of some film that was out at the time, like the sort of action. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And he went, oh, I've wanted to, I'd like to see that. So Neil went, well, can he watch it? I said, we can watch it. I said, if you like, I'd, I'd cook you something to eat and you can watch it. He said, yeah, thanks very much. So I cooked him a dinner. He watched the film with my son. So obviously his fingerprints was in my house on the table in the kitchen, he walked in, he went, oh, I'll wash up for you. I said, no, you're... he went, no, 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 I'll wash up. So his fingerprints was in my house. On the Monday, I never saw Danny again after that. On the Monday, I picked Ron up. As we walked in my house, and he, I said to him, I'll pick the, the milk up, he picked the milk up. And I don't even know if he'd put the milk down. That's how quick my door went bang. That was the loudest bang. 
And this man running, this big guy, a hat down here and a top up here. I did, didn't even realise it was down there. And he said in an Irish accent, get down on police. And Ron sort of just looked at him and went, what's up, mate? Like this. It, Everything in my life is so weird. And with that, he fired a shot. And I thought he'd been shot in the stomach because there was blood filling up this light-coloured jacket, light blue jacket. And he just stood there. And he went to him, like, what's up, mate? And with that, I'm in the co- bent in the corner and I'm sort of going like this. And I'm thinking... Am I going to get shot? I don't know what this is, what's going on here. And with that, there was another shot. And then I heard this really horrible noise and there was blood squirted everywhere in my kitchen. It was all down my back, it was all over. And as I looked round, Ron was, it was, he was standing there, he went like that, and it was Danny. And he went, you'll be all right, and run out. And he said to afterwards, I did that for Brian, because Brian said, he's got to be stopped or he'll kill her son. He said, no, I lost my son, so that's why I did it. How was that then, like all these men killing each other over you, basically? Mm. Do you know what I mean? It's fucking nuts. Like, how was it as well, seeing Ron dead in your kitchen? Oh, that was awful. That was horrible, and I can still hear that noise. It was a horrible noise. Like his last breath? Get shot. No, it was... Shot in the head? No, he was shot in the head. Mm-hmm. And it was all over the kitchen. And there was just this horrible noise of like... Shh, it must have been all the blood. Because you've always pleaded your innocence. You could have got out after seven yeah. stretch. But you end up doing an 18. Yeah. But the tale is as well that Danny was there. Couldn't kill him. You took the gun and shot him yeah. in the head. But I had... Um, forensic tests done at that time. No gun residue, no yeah. nothing. Yeah, and then they denied doing those tests. Why? Because the next day they said, you didn't tell us you were Linda Calvey. And I said, yes, I did. I, it's on my statement. Do you not have a lawyer with you? No, I didn't need one. Because when they, I ran out of the house, there was a copper in the street and he come running over and he, he sort of held my arm and went, oh, it's 12.28, it's a murder. Literally, a couple of minutes later, there were so many police cars. And they're saying to him, right, what happened? He said, a guy ran out. She's just come out. And there's somebody dead in there. So they said, right. So, obviously, I was the only person left there. They said, is there a gun in the house? No, there wasn't. Um, So they took me in as a witness, which is actually what I was. And they said, right, we can eliminate you while you're waiting for... They didn't even say put one of those horrible white suits on or anything. They said, have you got somebody that can get you some clothes? I phoned my brother and my brother said, yeah, I'll get clothes and I'll get them off my wife and I'll bring them. Before he arrived, they said, we can do some gun residue tests on you. Would you like us to do them? So I said, yes, please. So he said, would you like... Solicitor. So I said, why would I want a solicitor? He said, well, if they come back positive, we know it's you. I said, but I didn't do it. He said, well, we're offering to you, expecting them to come back negative. <coughs> they done the tests. They walked in and went, they're negative. It's a good thing you had that done. Two days later, the head of the murder squad said, what tests? We never done no tests. You didn't tell us you was that Linda Calvey. And that's when they charged me. So I set up, basically, there was no like, DNA forensics to see whether the blood squirted or anything. <coughs> well, the if blood it was, was on all down back, my back. Yeah, so if it was on your back, you couldn't have shot them. And they on. went, the, one of the forensic officers who, d- who did my coat said the only way she could have killed him is if her arms was eight foot long. I still, to this day, do not know how I got found guilty. How were you feeling when you get, when you got? Charged with murder? Well, I was shocked. Really shocked. And where was Danny and all this? Did he ever get charged? They charged him. They said, oh, we've fingerprinted. We found his fingerprints. And they went, but he's in prison. 
So he said, yeah, I was round her house. She picked me up. I had a meal in her house on Friday. And I said, do you really think if I, that I was anything to do with this? So he would have been in my house to put fingerprints all over my house. Yeah, plus you've done for conspiracy as well. Exactly. Like setting something up. So you ended up getting a seven. But yes. you could have got out earlier if you'd admitted it. Yeah, and I ended up doing 18 years because I wouldn't say I did it. Fully 18 Because I didn't. I didn't do it. And it's not because I didn't have anything to go home to. I've got a wonderful family. I've got my children. What did Danny get charged with? Exactly the same. Could he not have put his hands up and got you away with it? He said to me, when we first went, appeared in court, he said, tell him it was me. And I said, I can't. I can't do that. I can't. How can I say it was you? So you end up doing an 18 strikes. Listen, there's a lot of men out here who think they're tough men and they're snitches, sitting docks and point fingers. You've just done an 18 strikes and you could have got away with it by... I mean, I, dis- I described him exactly, but I didn't mm. say who it was. Mm-hmm. I described him. So how was that then for but your he's, life? No, but he did say to me, Linda, tell him it was me. So you're tell alive or dead me. now? So you're alive I dead. haven't seen him because on my licence I couldn't have any... The association? Yeah. What about the crazy and that? How did they come into your life? Um, Reg, from when I was away, uh, I got a letter saying, can I phone you? And I said, yeah. And we started, he used to ring me twice a week. I used to get bouquets and presents turn up from him. <laughs> <laughs> Every madman in the world trying to get your number and send you chocolates. Charlie. <laughs> They've asked him, are you Charlie Bronson oh, every, and Reggie Cray? <laughs> Charlie used to ask every six months. Uh. It's some fucking list there, Linda, honestly. <laughs> it's some list that, like, they obviously... Reggie and Ron, they're dead as well. Yeah. And Charlie, hopefully, get out next year. But how did they, why have you, if you, why is that you've got that? You must have something that these men fall in love with you. You must be, <laughs> you must have know. some sort of magic that <laughs> that these men are all killing themselves over yourself. You, yeah, like even though these men are manipulating you, but a part of me is saying that you've also manipulated yeah, every single I'm, one of yeah, them. Yeah, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. I'm sure you're very. <laughs> 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 to then even Ron in the prison with his chocolates under his arm never going yeah. to give you them ended up crumbling so yeah. you in my mind played every single one of these men as well against did. them to your own advantage yeah I probably I've got to say yeah I probably did yeah well I fair play as well but yeah. it's the the whole life through it when you got your 18 then how was what was that going through your mind knowing that you had kids knowing that you could have admitted I mean, the amount of people that said to me, I'll just say you did it, get home. And I went, no, I cannot say I did it. I was nothing to do with it. Do you ever think that karma plays a part as well because all the shit you did get away with, eventually catching up with you and balancing it out? Well, I suppose you can say that. How hard was that for you being so stubborn though, knowing that you had kids out here? I know, my kids used to cry every time I went up for my parole hearings. And I used to say, I can't say it. I can't say it. I never did it. I can't say it. Are you still fighting this day to get the yeah, conviction overturned? Yeah, and I still, I mean, it may be deluded, but be- now, obviously, everybody involved in that case is all retired, long retired, or dead, I suppose. But I think maybe one day... Especially now that sort of my books are coming out and whatever, that somebody might sit there and go, do you know what, she did tell the truth. That is true. And I still think one day somebody may go, I was given those tests to do. Yeah, they were negative. That wasn't even in that room. Or somebody one day I really think may turn around and say, it wasn't her. Never know who's watching this. Would you need a no. new piece of evidence to get a retrial? Well, I don't think you could get a retrial, retrial now. It's already been done, yeah? Yeah, it's all been done. Mm-hmm. So when you were doing your 18, how was that when you eventually, were you just getting used to that institutionalised? I never got institutionalised. Why is that? Because I always kept my head outside. Nobody was in the prison, my head wasn't. 
never ever was. But daydream of just taking your mind no, outside? No, I used to always write to my children, my brothers and sisters, my friends. Everything was, oh, what's going on out there? What's happening with you? What are you doing? How was your holiday? I always kept my head outside. How was it when Ron was murdered as well? How was, was there any remorse towards the man? Even all the shit that he'd done, the bad stuff? Or were you thinking, fuck him? I still don't know what I think. Still numb to it all? Mm. Mm-hmm. That can yeah. be a dangerous place to bat as well, especially if you're bottling all that emotion up. Do you know what I mean? Because mm. I know when you were doing your 18 stretch that the worst day that you've ever been was when your daughter got married yeah. and you couldn't be there. I mean, she kept putting it off. And, then, and in the end, I went well, get married. And she had this big wedding with loads of bridesmaids. And it was, you know, I thought that was my worst day. And then when grandchildren were being born and all the things that you sort of take for granted, you're going to be there for and and you're not. Is that when you start looking back in your life and going, mm. Mm, have I just messed up? Just... But again, looking back right from the start, you're a beautiful young, young girl. For me, looking from the outside, as if you were groomed from older men who manipulated it with money, mm. kind of power, and people buy into it. And that's sad because the amount of people who have grew up with or mm. who are then think the materialistic things is people buy into that life. But every gangster, every drug dealer, every bank robber I've ever now grown up or dead or in a jail majority of them turn to mm. drugs as well because they can't handle the pain the trauma that yeah. they've put themselves through and others, because there's always victims as well, yeah. getting into banks and doing all that shit and people's traumas and it does affect them so yeah of course it does Did you ever and even, I mean even today with I think nothing to do with me but I think it's so sad the way that the youths are gone today and Life is so cheap to them that they they don't think twice about wanting to stab each other, and it's for nothing. And they're youngsters, kids, yeah. and it's awful. I mean, friends of mine do uh, a charity, and that's for for Tony. Who was the charity Tony, called? For Tony Turner, mm-hmm. and um, that's t- to put down your knife. Mm-hmm. Yeah take back your life to put down your knife and I think kids don't realise prison is horrible don't think about it don't don't do it because you were in with some of the biggest monsters out you yeah. were in with Myra I mean, Hindley I, I personally Rose do West. know a young boy that um, he got life recommended 25 years and he was he was 20 so for a stabbing and another boy lost his life for nothing for a silly little argument. Yeah, well, uh, ego gets dented now. A lot of people find over postcodes, which is irrelevant. Yeah, because you were with, it's crazy. Yeah, you were surrounded by the biggest monsters yeah. probably the UK's yeah. ever seen with um, Rose West and Myra Hindley. How was that as well, being from the streets and obviously the crimes you've done? Yeah. There's no, you still done a lot of shit, but they were killing oh, they're, kids and they're, killing they're, a lot of people. They're sort of unbelievable people. That they, they are really are horror stories. Aren't you slapped Myra Hindley? Yeah, I did. <laughs> and I, was, I, I shocked myself, I think, when I did it. Because I was, they gave me a job in the library next door to where she was. And she was used to do the washing. And there was all these black and yellow stripes. Do not cross here. You get put on report. And one of the officers looked in and went, Oh, Linda, you can put your washing in before the factory comes out. So I said, OK. And I sort of just walked straight in. And she was pulling washing out the washing machine as she was singing. And I just walked up to her and she looked around and I just went whack. And she sort of went like this and went, I could get you sent back to Holloway for that. And I went, Holloway doesn't hold any fears for me, do what you like. And I thought, oh no, it's took me all this time to get here. And I was thinking they're going to come in in a minute and go, Linda, go and pack your stuff. Mm -hmm. But they didn't. In fact, the next day they come in and told me she sits and has her coffee in the library. So that was another crazy thing. How was it then being in for 18 years? Did you have like, any partners in there or was it difficult to be away for so long? No, it was, di- it was difficult. Mm-hmm. 
I made a, I made a couple of friends, but very, very few to yeah. think for all those years. A long time as well. What do you mm. think, looking back at that, being that time in prison, is it difficult? Is it difficult to speak about, Linda? It was, I mean, I think the maddest question that anybody ever says to me is, was it, did it seem very long? And it's like, what do you mean? It was 18 years. Of course it was long. It's a <laughs> lifetime. And the amount uh, of people that have said to me, question. oh, did it seem a long time? Uh, yeah, 18 years of long time. How did you get through it? Did you do any reading? Did you do any psych like, I used therapy? to read the newspaper every day. And I used to go to the gym. And uh, I got really into the gym. And I trained as a hairdresser in there. So I used to keep keep my time. Keep busy, keep your head mm. down. Did you ever when did you Well you can't ever win the system and that is that is the truth. You that's what can't people win yeah, it. that's what people need to learn from a very young age. You can't beat the system. You can't Nobody's beat too the clever. Every drug dealer that I've ever grew up with think they can beat the system. They can't. Everyone gets Nobody fucked can over. beat the system. Yeah. Once you're in that do- behind that door and you've been sentenced you can be the biggest, hardest person going, you're not going to beat that system. How did Charlie Bronson end up getting a hold of you? How did he <laughs> end up writing to you? Oh, he just fell in love with me and, wrote <laughs> and said to me... That seems to be every man that's ever in contact <laughs> with, you know. <laughs> you're the Black Rose. Uh-huh. Yeah, I'm not, That's a turn on for people, though. That shit. Same as like bad men and gangsters. People love that. Well, I've... I think I got over 50 wedding proposals. <laughs> Many did you accept? None of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got, and it's, they must be cranks. Who would want to write to somebody in a prison and say, will you marry me? It's nuts though, isn't it? Did you ever get married? In, were you married? You got married in prison? I did. Who was that to? I ended up marrying Danny. Yeah. And then I got divorced him. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Danny's the one who got done for the murder as well so when he was in prison you were in prison both mm. of you got married mm. so that looks suspicious then from the yeah. people looking from the outside I suppose it did but I mean but it was sort of quite a few years down the line we'd been away and I in the end thought there's only one person who knows what this is like and that's him and he said to me there's only one person who knows how I feel and that's show." And we were always fighting to, to get back to coal, whatever. And it, they used to bring him for visits. We used to have visits. And um, we said about it one day, do you know what? We might as well get married. No one else will ever have us. And said to the girls, and they went, oh, yeah, we can have a wedding. So it was all, yeah, all right, we'll get married. And then when we just said, like, this is mad, what are we doing this for? All the girls got so upset, we went, all right, we'd get married to keep the girls happy. So we got married and then we got divorced. A <laughs> couple of months later. Yeah. What was Brian saying to all this? The guy that ended up taking the yeah. blame as well and doing a 21 yeah. for you. What was he saying? Did he ever in contact with you while you were doing your 18? Oh, he used to write to me, yeah. Do yeah. you think you'd probably kept all these men as well as with you? Like Brian's, Danny's still in contact Charlie's Reggie but all these men no. probably thought that <laughs> they were yours and only yours yeah, and then when they probably found out they weren't that's why they ended up all fucking killing each other it was like a wild wild west over Linda <laughs> <laughs> so when you eventually when did you realise you were getting your release date because the, the law changed when you were doing yeah, your 18 and the law changed to say you didn't have to admit your guilt to be released you were judged on your behaviour in prison, um, your sort of plans for your release, etc. So without having to say, which I didn't, I would never have said that I did it, everything else, they said, well, she's a model prisoner. She's never done anything wrong. She's got a fantastic family to go home to. So... I fit all the criteria to be set free once they took that one thing away. Would you have died in prison, Linda? Yeah, if you, if yeah I would have done. Yeah. Stubborn, stubborn. I am, and stubborn. I would have. Even though you could have got out just for yeah. saying, putting your hands up and saying, yeah. I did that? Yeah. I would never have said it, ever. 
So when you got your release date, what was going through your mind? Um, well, I met George, didn't I? And I, <laughs> <laughs> and I got collected uh, in my Red Rolls Royce. Coming out of prison, you get, counted, <laughs> you get put, picked up. And you're, that's what I was talking about at the start. This Red Roller, you visualised when you were 11 years old. Yeah. Coming out after doing an 18 stretch for murder, get picked up in a Rolls Royce. Yeah. Isn't that mad how life kind of connects? That's what I'm saying. Yeah. That is mad. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And George died four years later, yeah. but he was cancer. There was no, had, no any poison or, or no. bullet to the head. No, bless him. <laughs> <laughs> People will be thinking, but fuck me, man. Like, oh, yeah. that's like, it just shows you no, that. No, he died of cancer, bless yeah. him. And it was him that said to me, right, your life is so amazing, Linda. Write your book. Mm-hmm. And... By writing the first book... Which is a Black Widow. Which, which is, is the some Black read, by Widow. the way, which we'll leave the links in the description. Um, from doing that one, and it was really well acclaimed, and I realised I really enjoyed writing, that then I created the my... Smith. The Locksmith. The mm-hmm. Locksmith. How was it writing the Black Widow? Was that a bit of therapy for you, to eventually put um, your story straight? Some of, Yeah, I'm, I was really pleased that I could do it, because I... Everybody had a, an opinion on me and everybody, you know, so I thought, no, I've sat back and let everybody say this, this, this. Now I'm going to write and put my side. Were you nervous about doing the book? No, I wasn't because I thought whatever I've written in there, nobody can challenge me on it because it's all true. Yeah. So, and as I say, because of that, I've now created my locksmith and mm. my ruby and there's a little bit of me in, in ruby i think mm-hmm. so you're enjoying writing because there's going to be more books coming yes, out after this. this this is the first one and there's i'm on to the part two mm-hmm. what do you think looking back at you see because you've lived it it might not seem as nuts but for people listening because you're the first kind of lady boss kind of yeah people who you were a gangster yeah you're the first, you're probably the one and only that I've ever came across that there is something about you, your energy, where you, it's quite, can be quite intimidating. So men would have probably felt fear from you. Really? Which is, yeah, for, which is probably a strange thing. Like, I think you'd have had men, you'd have had them eating out your hand for some reason, <laughs> but, which is mad. You probably know what I'm talking about. Yeah, but uh, in the past, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about the love life now? <laughs> Well, I'm living a nice, quiet life now. Yeah. Who knows what the future holds? Mm-hmm. You must be a strong man. <laughs> is anyway. there anybody brave yeah. enough? <laughs> <laughs> I think that is the golden question, isn't it? I definitely think that. So we'll put that in your dating app. But is there anybody brave enough? But with the men who I think you've came across in your life, I think there is men out there that think every man thinks they can tame a woman. They can't. No. People need to, and you're, you're living proof of that. So when you started going through your life and started making changes, getting a bit of family life together, how was it trying to change? What age did you get out, Linda? Um, I was 59. So how was it then coming out to society with everything kind of changing? Was it weird? Well, it just seemed normal. Was it? Yeah. That very next day I was driving. Did people try and get you back involved? No. Nah. No. Too old people. Are, yeah. The people that I used to do, that, that mm-hmm. even villains retire. Yeah, they get tired. <laughs> they get tired. They do. Yeah, they do. Look, who's the maddest person you've ever came across? Ron. Ron Cook? Mm. I've never heard of, I've never heard of this man either. No. Nah. Was he, was he friendly with any of the like Richardson's craze? Was he... He knew everybody. Was people scared of him? Yeah, everybody was scared of him. Everybody. And it's funny because when it happened, they set an incident room up in the school behind. And my sister worked in that school. And everybody was going, oh, my God, who was it? And she thought, no, it's my sister's house. But she didn't want to say because she was in the school. And... When the police come round and went, you're not going to believe it. It's only Ronnie Cook who's dead. And she said the caretaker sweeping went, oh, the East End will be celebrating tonight. Mm-hmm. 
That's mad, isn't it? Yeah. People that feared of him. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They really were. Five feet eight, not kiss. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What do you think now, walking by a bank? Do you think, man, I could still take that on? Or do you, no. do you, nah? <laughs> what do you think of the cameras and that now and everything, all the technology and all yes. the... Oh, you couldn't do. You mm-hmm. couldn't do what we used to do. Uh-huh, because I spoke to... That's a bygone era. Yeah, but do you ever walk by and think, mm, I could, I could... Odd occasions. I don't know, I mean, I'll think, no, I don't think that. But sometimes I'll drive past somewhere and go, and I might say mm-hmm. to whoever, say, oh, God, I robbed that. Mm-hmm. I go, uh-huh. They go, like, mm-hmm. you, you know, it's sort of... What do you think looking back in your life? I know we have a laugh and a joke, but obviously yeah. some serious stuff. But what do you think, like, looking back and thinking, wow, yeah, roller coaster? Well, you can't change it, can you? So you just got to... Make the best of it. Just got to crack on. Yeah. That's all you can do. I've always been a glass half full, uh-huh. which is, you've got to be. You've got to be, man. You've got to concentrate you've on the positives. To, yeah. You were led down that life. That's the cards you've been dealt. You're yeah. still breathing, though, so it's all yeah. down to you. That's it. How you want to play the, the rest of your hand. That's right. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah. What about for anybody watching? I've never said this. I was like, men that's <laughs> watching, I say, for any of the youth or young kids, but for any, like, girls as well, because there's girls look up and want to be bad as well and angry and do bad shit but for any advice for the youth yeah please don't there's nothing glamorous about being locked in a prison cell with that door shut behind you and you're stuck there and you've got people bullying you or you being the bully and you're getting treated like rubbish a lot of the times there's nothing glamorous think about it Especially, as I say, with Tony, is this culture nowadays with this stabbing so it's terrible. Yeah. Don't even think about it, kids. There's nothing good. One minute and you're in prison, and that's it. You're there for years. What do you think of the generation now to 40 years ago? Do you think it was more, even though it was still violent then, but do you think it was more respect then? Do you look at it people was, now? It was violent then, but there was respect. And I know people go, oh, yeah, all right. But there was, there, there was, I don't know why, there's not, in just everyday life, there's not the respect that there used to be. I mean, I, I remember when I was young, and if you see somebody old get on a bus, you'd stand up for them to sit down, or somebody pregnant or holding a child, or a man would hold a door open for you to walk through. And... All those sort of things, it's very rare now that you actually do see these things. And I think, I don't know, there's a lot of kids have been brought up and they've had drug addict parents, they've not had or broken homes, or they've had stepdads or stepmums that have been crap to them. And they hate the world and they think, so what, I can do this and I can do that. But what? it's not the yeah. right thing to do. What, Linda, now, what advice would you give for... Linda at 19. Linda at 19. Don't go to that party. (laughs) (laughs) You mean I'm going to go as well? (laughs) Fuck me, man. What a roller coaster that has been the last 50 years, 40 years. But but this is life. Linda, for coming on today, I don't normally say this, but I believe this is one of my best podcasts I've ever done. I've nearly done 200. Your story is mind blowing and it's mad. It's full of absolute madness in it. But you're a good woman we've been speaking the last <laughs> few months and try to get you on I know you've got yeah. your book out so people go and buy it there's plenty Please more coming please buy my new book yep. and um, for coming on today and telling your story I thoroughly enjoyed that thank um, you take care God bless you thank you check out more of my podcasts on the right And be sure to like, share and comment your thoughts on this week's podcast. Thank you.